Do you feel the vibes? What's up everybody and welcome to the Recreational Engineer. In the last episode of Building a Quadcopter, we talked about the competition we could be competing in, we decided on a flight controller, and we even got a really good radio for this build. In today's episode, we're going to be going over our preliminary design for the prototype, as well as actually getting our hands dirty and doing some real work in the shop. So, for the preliminary CAD model, I used a program called SOLIDWORKS made by Dassault Systems. I started using SOLIDWORKS in my engineering undergraduate degree when they first sponsored our Formula SAE team. I found that SOLIDWORKS was one of the most intuitive CAD programs I've used over the couple years, and it's going to be the program I'm going to be using moving forward in this project. Now, when I started designing this quadcopter, I had a couple constraints in mind. Number one, I'm going to be using this primarily for filming. So in order to do that, I can't have a flight time of three minutes, and I really need to be able to lift something like a decent quality camera. So essentially, I want to be able to fly for at least 20 minutes continuously, and I want to be able to have a three pound payload that I can still move around comfortably with. Secondly, I didn't want to make something that was too small and that would be really adversely affected by small winds. So something like this quadcopter really isn't going to cut it for my purposes. I figured I'm going to have to go with something much, much larger. So when I did my design, I wanted to be able to accommodate at least a 14-inch propeller, even though I'll probably be using 12-inch propellers. Now, for the actual chassis itself and the material selection, I wanted to use as much carbon fiber as possible. By using carbon fiber, I'm able to keep the weight down and I won't have to be lugging around as much dead mass to keep it flying. So in order to make the carbon fiber, or the arms, I decided to use these carbon fiber tubes. You can get them off of Hobby King. They're super light, they're really stiff, and uh, they're only about $2.50 for a 330 millimeter section. For the body itself, I got some of this carbon fiber plate off of eBay. That's also really, really stiff for how much it weighs. So when I did my design, I tried to do as many planar shapes as possible. That way I would just be able to cut it out on the water jet. By doing planar shapes, we won't have to do any custom carbon fiber layups that will really add time to this project. Now, for the prototype, I'm just going to be using aluminum sheets because it'll be quicker for us to make iterations and we'll just be able to punch it out on the drill press. But for now, let's take a look at the design that I have so far. This is the preliminary design that I came up with in SOLIDWORKS. As you can see, I've gone with an X-type configuration. I figured that this was the most logical way to go because doing an H-type configuration where I would have the arms out this way and out this way with a long chassis would give me a way, way lower moment of inertia in roll than it would in pitch. And if I did this, it would result in really uneven handling characteristics, with something, which was something that I figured is pretty undesirable. So one of the first things I did was I went onto Hobby King's website to look at all the various lithium polymer batteries that they offered. When I did that, I picked out about five or six that I figured would be appropriate for this build, and I modeled them in SOLIDWORKS, and then I gave them a density that would accurately represent their mass. Once I had all of them represented, I started designing various chassis around the batteries. And the reason why I designed the, ja the chassis around the batteries was because when you're designing a quadcopter, it's really important to make sure that your center of gravity is right in the center of the quadcopter itself. If you don't do this, then one of the motors is always going to be compensating for the imbalances in your design. The batteries that I ended up going with were a 5200 milliamp hour four cell lithium polymer battery that puts out 14.8 volts with a maximum current at about 52 amps. I decided to run two of these because I figured that 52 amps probably wouldn't be enough power for a quadcopter like this. So by having two of them in parallel, I can get over 100 amps of power and it doubles my capacity to allow me to achieve that long flight time that I'm aiming for. So once I finished up with that, I decided to make all small little modifications to the chassis. I decided to take my receiver and my uh, flight controller and put them both in line along with the power distribution module right down the center of the chassis. I figured this would continue with my goal of centralizing the weight. I went on Amazon and I ordered a bunch of nylon standoffs. That way I'll be able to add a protective guard on top of all these sensitive components. One of the other things I wanted to look into the future for was actually having a camera gimbal. By having one of these gimbals, it actually auto levels the camera constantly. That way when you're moving your quadcopter around and rolling it up and down, the camera always stays level to the ground. Finally, the last thing I did was I decided that I would make my own inboard tube clamps for the carbon arms. By doing this, I didn't have to make any compromises in the design of the chassis because I would, able, I would be able to design these however I wanted. So all I did was I went on McMaster Car and found some 3 quarter inch bar stock of ABS and I just made a relatively planar design. I thought I'd hog out the center portion here to allow it to act as a clamp and that way we would be able to sandwich the carbon tube but it would still have a nice soft interface and I wouldn't have to worry about cracking like I would if I did it with like an aluminum part 
for example. So that pretty much summarizes our preliminary design. Now it's time to get into the shop and start punching this baby out. The first step we took was to use a basic home printer to create a one-to-one -one scale template that we could tape directly onto our material. Having the template on top allowed us to save tons of time that we normally would have to spend marking out the sheet manually. Once our template was securely fixed to the plate, we put the material on top of some scrap MDF to keep it off the work table. Because our holes were small enough, we were able to use a center drill for the whole process. After quickly verifying that our template was working like we hoped, we moved on to the shear to trim the material down to size. A shear is a machine that cuts through metal plate by sandwiching it between two blades. It's almost like a giant pair of hydraulic scissors. Here I'm just setting up the blades to be the correct distance apart for the particular thicknesses of our aluminum sheet. This particular machine actually projects a laser line down onto the workpiece to indicate where it's going to separate the material. So I lined up my sheet and I made my cut. With the two pieces cut, I could let Brad get to work on the bottom plate while I finished punching out the rest of the holes in the top plate using the drill press. Once Brad finished up the bottom plate, we quickly ran back to the shear to trim it to size before moving on to the metalwork. The metal worker is a compact hydraulic sheet metal machine. It allows us to trim fine corners, bend thick plate, or even quickly punch out holes in some pretty thick material. Right here I'm trimming a flap that we can later bend up. This little flange will help us keep the batteries contained in the chassis. With all of the trimming finished, we moved on to the brake. The brake is a manual sheet metal tool that allows us to bend sections of the plate to various angles. Although it's a pretty simple machine, it'll give us more than enough accuracy for this prototype frame. With all the metal work wrapped up, it was time to start working on the tube clamps. This machine here is really cool. It's called the water jet. It takes a mixture of sand and water and pressurizes it to 60,000 psi and uses it to cut through up to one inch thick steel in a single pass. In this instance, we're just using it to cut out the rectangular profiles for our inboard tube clamps. After coming off of the water jet, the blocks still need some final machining. Here I'm just drilling out the holes that would later be tapped, allowing us to fix the top and the bottom chassis plates together. The last operation on these parts was to use an end mill to create a gap on the side so that they would be able to flex and function as a clamp for the carbon tubing. Now onto the carbon tubes we'll be using for the arms. We ordered the tubes some extra lengths, they would have some flexibility in our design. The individual carbon strands tend to fray when they're cut, so a trick we used was to wrap them in masking tape to stop this from happening.
Finally, we busted out our high-tech measuring tape and sharpie and marked out where we wanted to trim using the abrasive drop saw. When trimming carbon tubing, it's really best to use an abrasive cutter saw like this as opposed to something with teeth. The teeth tend to really cut up the carbon strands and give you a really rough cut. I really hoped you guys enjoyed this episode of The Recreational Engineer and were able to get a bit of an inside view on what it takes to actually manufacture a prototype chassis. In the next episode, we're going to be choosing all of our electronical components, like our speed controllers and our motors, getting them all routed through the chassis and soldering the whole thing together. If you guys have comments or suggestions for future videos, let me know in the comments section below. If you like this video, give it a like. And if you want to see more content like this, subscribe to this channel. But for now, I'll see you guys all in the next episode of The Recreational Engineer. Girl, you feel the